Good evening. Good evening. I want to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order. <clears throat> Certainly want to welcome everyone here tonight, both those who are here with us in the council chambers and also those who are watching on television. We're glad to see you uh, and, and uh, want to warmly welcome you here tonight. I'm going to first ask if everyone would please join me in a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. <clears throat> and now we have a something special tonight. Cub Scout Pack 451 is with us tonight. Did I get that right, guys? Yeah. Great. And they're they're from Westminster Presbyterian Church, and they're going to lead us in the pledge to the flag. So will you all please rise and lead us the, in the pledge to the flag? Thank you. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well done. Good job, Scouts. We appreciate you all being here tonight. You look great in your Scout uniforms, and we want to thank your Scout leaders who are here with you as well and parents. So. Well done. Good job. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mayor Shul. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Middleton. Here. Councilmember Reese has requested and received a motion for an excused absence. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, before we go to announcements by the council, I believe we have a couple of other excused absences coming up, and I think we'll go ahead and take action on those. Uh, Councilmember Freeman and Councilmember Middleton are going to ha need excuse absences for this coming Thursday's work session. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And Councilmember Reese as well. Uh, and I think he already uh, has his uh, absence. So uh, I'll accept a motion to uh, give excuse absences to Councilmember Freeman and Councilmember Middleton, who will be at conferences uh, uh, this coming uh, Thursday's work session. So moved. Second. Okay. Been moved and seconded uh, that we uh, give these excused absences. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll now have announcements by members of the council. Councilmember Freeman. Oh, thank you. I thank you for the um, moment, just a moment. I um, wanted to take a moment and just say that um, I'm enjoying uh, this week an advanced leadership training with the School of Government, and this is where I, which is why I won't be here on Thursday. And um, also noting that with the Durham Youth um, Internship Project or Program, I wanted to make sure that folks are aware that we have. Um, up to a thousand students actually we're hoping to fill fill slots for it or fill interview slots for over a thousand students and i want to encourage folks in the community to take part and actually being a part of uh, the interviews and filling on filling in the slots to interview the students um, as a part of uh, the work for this community um, getting our kids prepared for their future careers and the work that they get they can do now or any part that you could play in the work that they do now would be helpful so those are two, and I, there was one more, but I'll... Thank you very much, Council Member. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just had a couple things I wanted to mention. On our consent agenda, item number three, Community Safety Task Force Bylaws, I've been contacted by a few community members who were part of writing the proposal for the Community Safety Task Force last year who would like to give feedback on the bylaws but haven't been able to do it um, before tonight and would like to request that we postpone that item to our next work session on Thursday. Um, and also would just like to um, appreciate the Community Development Department and the folks at Legal Aid for the eviction diversion uh, contract that we will be approving 
tonight also as part of our consent agenda. We've been slowly increasing the amount of funding that we're giving to legal aid over the last couple of years to help them represent residents in Durham who are facing evictions. But we know that even with uh, this increase in funding that they are only going to be able to represent about 10% of the eligible tenants who are facing eviction in our city. Um, so just wanted to both um, express my excitement for the fact that we're increasing the funding, but also acknowledge that there's still a great need out there and we need to continue to think about ways to, um, to help tenants in our city who are, who are facing evictions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, sir, and good evening to all of you. And to my colleagues, I want to thank my colleagues for the gracious uh, excused absence for this Thursday. I'll be uh, flying to San Francisco to attend a conference in Silicon Valley, a National League of Cities, a sponsored trip uh, to Silicon Valley to meet with tech and corporate leaders there and to find out ways we can leverage uh, some of the incredible innovations in Silicon Valley here locally. Uh, to fight homelessness, using technology to fight homelessness and deal with issues of equity uh, and sustainability. So I look very forward to, to going out there and milking them for all of that brilliance out there and seeing if we can bring anything back uh, to our city and use it here in our work. Um, I was going to, Mr. Mayor, um, introduce a, a brilliant young political science student. Today we onboarded an intern uh, that I've hired to work with me, a uh, brilliant young student from North Carolina Central University, Ms. Imani Johnson, so I look forward to introducing her. She couldn't be here tonight, uh, but I'm excited about that and look forward to introducing her to the city uh, and to this group in the coming days. Finally, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to go on record tonight uh, about an issue that has captured uh, the attention of many of us uh, in the city of late. Uh, not too long ago, we received some national attention uh, regarding uh, an op-ed that appeared in USA Today, uh, penned by my distinguished colleague, the Mayor Pro Tem, and an elected colleague uh, from St. Louis. In that op-ed, a characterization was made about our city. Um, Durham, North Carolina is one of the poorest performing cities in the country when it comes to use of force uh, regarding our uh, police department. That uh, characterization uh, was uh, pursuant to, or I should say subsequent to the use uh, of a tool, uh, which in my assessment was not very scientific um, it was basically inviting us to do word searches on some of our policies, and if we didn't have precise phraseology, we were dinged by it. Um, I want to go on record strongly repudiating and rejecting that characterization uh, of this city and of our city's uh, police department as well. I do that as one who has worked in tandem with folk in the city that have worked incredibly hard to usher in transformation to the culture uh, of our police department. I also want to say I know that many were um, uh, fascinated with the response from our city manager uh, to our mayor pro tem. You usually don't get to see us talk like that to each other publicly, but I do want to say uh, that I think the city manager's response was direct, it was forceful, it was factual, and it was done in a way that did not cross the line of insubordination. Uh, so I want to affirm and associate myself with the city manager's comments, but I want to go a little further because colleagues, I think it's important that we as the elected leadership of the city uh, go on record uh, and make clear to the, to the citizenry and residents of the city and our neighbors and friends uh, that we are, while we vote 98% of the time the same way, we are not a monolithic council. Uh, I want us to be clear, uh, at least I want to be clear, that that characterization of our police department does not square, I believe, with the work uh, that's been done. Let me give you a little bit of an intellectual framework um, for me, how I approach this work. Um, I don't think that there's any institution in America uh, particularly when it comes to black people, that does not need to be deconstructed, renegotiated, or dealt with in some way. If everything was left in its original setting in America, we'd be in trouble, not just with police. The police aren't exotic. The criminal justice system, baseball, football, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Statue of Liberty. Everything in this country needs to be renegotiated and deconstructed and dealt with. That includes the police, that includes the, uh, includes the criminal justice system. So I am well aware that we have not um, come as far as we need to come in terms of, of dealing with policing in America, but some things have happened in this city over the last six to seven years, and I think it's important that we point that out. Uh, I believe that sitting in these seats up here makes us brand ambassadors for our city. I think that each of us up here ought to be tripping over one another racing to defend the honor of this city, 
and to defend the honor of this municipal workforce. Not gaslight people, not lie. If there are things that need to be called out, we need to do that. But facts matter and truth matters. And the fact is that this department's use of force numbers have been trending downward. That's the fact. The wholesale, I believe, the wholesale appropriation of nationalized talking points, uh, localizing them without nuance and without context, I believe is irresponsible. And I believe it's damaging to the morale of our workforce. We've got some work to do, but work has been done. I believe the op-ed does a couple of things. One, I think it mischaracterizes our police department. Two, I think it does not show the proper deference and respect to the incredible work that activists have done in this city over the years to transform the culture of this police department. That work has been real, and it's been impactful, and it's empirically observable. I don't think the op-ed took that into account. I also don't think it take into, takes into account the remarkable and I believe transformative leader that we have in Sarah Lynn Davis. What has she been doing the last few years she's been here? She's been making an impact and she's been working to further transform the culture of this department. I don't think that op-ed uh, accurately reflected that work and I think that it's done damage to the morale uh, of our city. This department is not the same department it was 10 years ago. Do we have work to do? Of course, of course we do, but facts matter and truth matters. This is a nationally accredited police department with a transformative leader, and I consider Sarah Lynn Davis as transformative a leader as I do Satana DeBerry and Clarence Burkhead. All of them are progressive leaders bringing new ideas and fresh innovations to areas that have done damage to us historically in America and need reform. And we have leaders that are doing that work, and I think we ought adequately reflect that. So I wanna go on record tonight respectfully uh, distancing and, and quite honestly repudiating uh, the words in that op-ed about our city and about our police department and also recommit myself, hopefully with thousands of you in the city, to continuing to do the work that we need to do and know needs to be done to continue to transform the culture uh, of this department. Facts matter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Any further announcements? Just one. Council Member Freeman. I also um, want to associate myself with those comments and making sure that it's clear that I also do not appreciate the way in which this, um, the taking an op-ed as the opportunity to kind of highlight the issues when you're on the council is not um, healthy. And I just want to make sure that we're cognizant of how we do that and make sure that we move forward in a better way. So don't, I, I agree with a lot of points around how we, need to get there, but there are national issues that we have to get to. And I think here in Durham, we can do a better job than this. We can do a better job than just pointing a finger. And I, I know that um, what has happened in the last two years that I've been here has been unfortunate and really hard to handle. I also can't agree more with um, Councilmember, Councilmember Middleton in that our chief and our city manager have been working really hard to shift the way that things work here. And noting that there is such a disproportionality in all of the matters, in not just criminal legal or what have you, but also in housing and in economic development and in you know so many other areas, we have work to do. And I'd, I'd like to think that we can come up with solutions and not just be about the problem. And so um, I, along those lines, I wanted to take a moment and thank staff. I know that um, I'm on the, the Jordan Lake One Water uh, Alliance and it has been raised a number of times just how great our staff has been as a resource to many other cities or many other communities around us regionally and supporting the work to move us forward recognizing that water has no boundaries. And I just wanted to make sure I take a moment and thank staff for that. I know I have a tendency to be hard on staff in some situations, but it's also important to make sure that you acknowledge when staff is doing the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements by members of the council? All right. If not, we'll move on to Priority items by the city manager. Mr. Manager, any priority items tonight? Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor. Members of council have no priority items this evening. Madam Attorney. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Members of city council, I also have no items this evening. Madam Clerk. Good evening, everyone. The city clerk's office has no items. Thank you very much. 
We'll now move on to the consent agenda. This agenda is made up of items that have been previously worked on by the council and can be approved by a single vote of the council tonight. Any item can be pulled from the consent agenda by any member of the public or a member of the council, and if it is pulled, will be held to the end of the meeting for consideration. <laughs> so I'll be reading the consent agenda items. Item three, Community Safety Task Force Bylaws, and uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, uh, you pull this item and it will be to be considered at Thursday. the, on what day? Work session this Thursday. At the work session this coming Thursday, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, item four, grant contract with legal aid of North Carolina to provide representation to city of Durham residents facing eviction. This item was pulled from the agenda by someone who I don't see a name, but I see an address, which is the same as another address here, Waldo Fenner. Mr. Fenner, are you here? Yes. Did you pull that agenda item from the agenda item four, sir? Yes. Okay, we'll hold that to the end of the meeting. Thank you. Uh, item five, um, shared active transportation report and an ordinance revision. And this item was also pulled by resident Mimi Kessler. Uh, we will hold this to the end of the meeting as well. Item six, bid report, December, 2019. Item seven, installment financing contract series 2020 fleet. Item eight, land lease with global sign, signal acquisitions, LLC, 3510 Sandy Creek Drive. Item nine, amendment to consultant contract for citywide classification and compensation study, non-sworn. Item 10, grant from Duke University Health System, DUHS, Office of Community and Local Government Relations. Item 12, Environmental Systems Research Institute Software Maintenance Agreement. Item 13, Participatory Budgeting PB Agreement to Fund Technology for Durham Public Schools. Those are the items on the consent agenda, and with the exception of items three, four, and five, I will now ask for a motion that we approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. We moved and second that we approve the consent agenda. agenda. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll now move on to our next agenda item, uh, which is McDougal Terrace public comments. I have several people signed up to speak. Um, and I'm going to call them in the order in which they signed up. Uh, first will be Ms. Wilma Liverpool. Ms. Ms. Liverpool, welcome. Uh, please come to the uh, podium, and uh, you have three minutes. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon to the city council and everyone else here. This issue with McDougal Terrace is what I call an issue that must have answers and the answers need to be done now. But first of all, I want the residents to understand who we are, who they are, and we have to learn our history and how this has come about and I have what I call a why factor, W-H-Y. When you're asking hard questions and someone gives you an answer, just ask, but why is that the answer? And continue back until there is no other answer and you see from which it comes. My thing is, why is McDougal Terrace still viable in 2020? Is it money that's been kept and stolen from our community that hasn't been passed down to the descendants? It's not a new problem. This, well, that community's been going on like 67 years and people are just being put over and over and over again with almost no legal way to get out. What psychological intense healing has ever been given to our community in the past, everybody else's community, oh, let's provide some healing for them, but we've never had that as an item. Has breathing carbon monoxide interfered with academic success of children? Is there anyone checking on that, or is it we just don't care? These are people in poverty. 
are your and our basic needs being met on a daily basis? Can we live with dignity? When poverty is forced upon you, it changes the dynamic of how you're seen. Do we have clean air? Do we have healthy food? Do we have safe neighborhoods? And what I really got just really ticked off about was to hear on the news media a reporter who says, these people are needy and in need. My thing is, no, they just haven't been given what is theirs to get themselves to where they need to be. Where does racism fit in? It fits in from the top down. You and me, we are equal to anyone. <laughs> We're just less financially profitable. The Bible says, love God, do justice. That means correct what is not right and don't put charity as a Band-Aid on it that this is something you did and you're responsible for it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Liverpool. <laughs> Next, we'll hear from Mr. Waldo Fenner. And following Mr. Fenner will be Ashley Kennedy and then uh, Lysanda Ormond. Welcome, Mr. Fenner. You also have three minutes. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Some of you will love me, some of you will hate me. I don't want to talk about the, the race issue with MacDougall. It's been a problem since I've been here since 1995. Mayor Bell was here. Patrick Baker was here. Now we have a city manager who's here. The very same city manager who wants to do a 2% food tax to build a museum down at the ballpark and claim that black folks don't support it. Well, black folks can't afford to pay $7 for a beer or $5 for a hot dog. We don't have those kind of jobs. So I'm not here to discuss all that stuff there. But I do want to point the blame, and you are part of the problem. You've been here long enough to know better. I am sick and tired of black folks being the ones who get the short end of the stick. You've given, was it $15 million since 2015? Does that include the $7 million that you gave beforehand? So now you're talking about a total of $21 million. Where is our money? You all appointed the commissioners at McDougal and you allowed them to give this man, Scott, a raise. He did jack. And now you got the nerve to sit up here and tell us that you're not accountable? Yes, you are. You are very accountable. The op-ed that Ms. Johnson did was right on point. I'm a living example of police corruption. I've been in the same house since 1995. They knock on my door, I'm a drug dealer. I work hard. Been caught nigger, queer, faggot, the whole damn nine yards to get what I've got. You sent neighborhood improvement out there to us, but you didn't send neighborhood improvement to MacDougall? Now you want to give $500,000 to legal aid to fight evictions. You can't pay your rent, you can't pay your rent. If I got a mortgage for $500, why would I let somebody stay in my place who can't afford to pay the rent? You waste the money that we have given for taxes. And you want to give it to legal aid, who should be funded by the state. That $500,000 could have gone to where? To McDougal, lower property tax, some of that next year. But yet and still, you chose, who was it at that time, to build a police department, $50 million. And now you're trying to tell us, you don't have no concern of it. It's not your problem anymore. But it is. Every last one of you was at that, here at that time should be in jail. Because what you did was dehumanizing. It was to put people's lives in jeopardy while you sit there and collect your paycheck. Why we have to pay high property tax for you to give our money to people who should not have earned that check in the beginning. The first thing you should have done was called Mr. Scott to be investigated and removed from that position. Thank you, Mr. Fenner. <laughs> Up there from, <laughs> Bill from Ashley Kennedy.
Ms. Kennedy, welcome. You have three minutes. Um, I feel personally like we're still beating a dead horse. This situation is not getting no better. We're going into almost two months now in a hotel. And as you can see, Mr. Mayor, you went with us to the hotels and how crises are real at these hotels. Our children are not safe at these hotels. You've seen it yourself. You've seen the fights breaking out. You've seen people having to be taken out with mental health issues. What else can be done by people? This enough is enough. Mr. Scott just told us our families might be in hotels to March 1st. That is unacceptable. And we already have three host hotels saying that they're not renewing, renewing nothing else. Those residents have to go because they're losing business because our residents are staying there. So how many people are gonna be willing to open up their homes and start letting residents come stay there? I pay good rent from MacDougall. I don't live there for free and I do work every day. So what else can the city council do to help Mr. Scott make this correct? Can y'all start renting out buildings? I mean, something, something has to be done because you've seen it yourself, how many people have been taken out for what? High blood pressure, mental illness, all of this stuff because they're cooped up in one room. Families are being separated. Residents are losing their jobs. Kids are missing school. Kids are getting up at six o'clock in the morning and not getting home to eight or nine o'clock at night. Can you imagine doing this for three months and then y'all wonder why their grades are dropping and why the kids are being suspended from school? Yes, kids are being suspended from school that are displaced. I have two kids right out there right now on a 10-day suspension. And then they have to go to school and worry about carbon monoxide and gas leaks. Come on, Durham. Like, the next time I come up here, I'm not gonna be as calm because they telling me in a week that I'm gonna have to be in a hotel too because they're turning off power for five to seven days and residents are about to lose everything in their refrigerators. Residents are told to come back and clean their homes up so they can come in and, and bug spray and all that other stuff. Like something, some, all this money's being wasted and the residents are still yet, almost $7 million later, sitting in the same jacked up situation. So the next time I come here, I'm gonna turn it up a couple more notches because y'all already know how I'm moving. Thank you, Ms. Canada. <clears throat> Our next speaker will be uh, Lysanda Ormond. <clears throat> Welcome, and you also have three minutes. Thank you. Um, same thing Ashley just said. Um, we're being told to go back and clean, the, clean, out of our, um, clean out the apartments, empty our refrigerators. They don't, no, I don't have a refrigerator full, thank God, because I would have been upset having to throw food out that I can't go and cook at the hotel. Um, however, I stopped by my apartment when I got off yesterday. I couldn't even stay in there to do anything because I was freezing. Um, we don't have any heat in there, so how they want us to go in there and try to straighten up something or do anything in there, I don't know. Um, but I will say, I'll give them a positive, Mr. Foster, Ms. Lisa, and Mr. Green, I will thank them for bending over backwards, helping me with stuff that I needed last week. But other than that, I am ready to go home. And if they're gonna take us out of one hotel, they need to let us know something instead of waiting until the last minute to tell us something. Because I've been hearing from other people that we're having to be out on the 14th. Then I'm asking people that work for DHA, nobody have a clue what they're talking about. So if they're gonna take us out, I need to know something before the last minute. I work full time, I can't just drop what I'm doing and call out of work. I have three kids to take care of. Like I said before, I'm almost paying market rate rent there. So no, I cannot call out of work anymore. I've missed over 30 hours of work with this stuff going on. Then another issue with Durham Police Department, um, maybe Ms. Davis needs to talk to some of her officers because yes, it has been issues at the Millennium. However, there was an issue that transpired the other night and it wasn't a DHA resident at the bar area. Um, there was another lady that felt um, that children shouldn't be anywhere near the bar area. They have chairs and everything else. They even have the little Shirley Temple drinks for the children. She's taking pictures of a lady with her kids in the area and threatened, oh, she's gonna call the police. The bartender 
told her it's nothing illegal, you can call if you want. She called the police, they pretty much told her the same thing, but before they did that, they went and spoke with the bartender and she explained to them that the lady and her children hadn't done anything wrong. They sat there and mind their business. The police responded with, was it a three or four day um, stay or were they with DHA? What's the difference? If her and her children weren't doing anything wrong, what's the difference? This was a Caucasian lady that called the police. This was an African-American mother with her three children that weren't doing anything wrong. So my question is, if they weren't with DHA, were they gonna have a problem with the lady? But by them being with DHA, they were just gonna give her a pat on the back of her hand and tell her don't do it again. So thanks to the Millennium Hotel, they did handle that because had it been left at the Durham Police Department, nothing would have been done about it because she was from DHA and she didn't do anything wrong. Thank you, Ms. Orman. Next speaker is Rafiq Zaidi. Mr. Zaidi. Mr. Zaidi, welcome. You have three minutes. Uh, good evening, Mayor Shaw. I'm going to be straight to the point. Uh, I have high respect for Chief Davis. High respect. Because what we had in uh, Chief Lopez, we caught hell. That's why I understand where Julian is coming from on one point. We have pedophiles circling around our hotels like buzzards. Our young ladies who are well endowed, dressed right, have to almost have police escort to the hotel. See, Anthony Scott don't talk about this. He be on radio talk shows and everywhere else, but he do not talk about the conditions that we are living in in these hotels. But I'll be damned if I won't. Mayor Shaw, you appointed the board, DHA board. Julian, you said something on the board. I appeared before the board a week ago, exactly. And I told them about California and pedophiles at our hotel where our children are. And I warned them, if one of our children disappear or be harmed because you, who sat on this couch are too weak, too spiny to tell Chief Davis to put more security on our family, you will have a price to pay also. Our children deserve to be able to walk around hotels, to go to snack machines, to buy cookies, to buy soda, to even run up and down the rails of the hotel without men who are smoking cocaine, crack cocaine, without men who are prostituting women in the hotel, looking outdoors, looking at our young girls' backside. We deserve better than this. We deserve better than this. Now you can sit up there and play like you don't give a damn. We are warning you one more time. The next person we catch looking at our young girls, you got a price to pay as well as them. Put some security on these hotels. Put some security on these hotels. I'm going to repeat it one more time. Put some security on our children. If one of them be harmed, this city will not have any rest. You will not have any peace. You put them in that condition. You brought Anthony Scott in here. You knew that McDougal was in that condition for over 60 years. But you sat there and you played games with us. You played with our lives. You're going to tell us that two babies, two young babies, disappeared. Their death is unexplained. Thank under you, suspicious Mr. conditions. Thank and you, you want us to go further. No, more than thank you tonight. You're going to have to arrest me tonight. If we find one more pedophile serving in those hotels, you sure are going to pay a price. Thank you, Mr. Zaidi. I'll repeat what I said at the work session, Mr. Zaidi. If you see someone who you think is doing something wrong, 
you need to call 911. As I said before. Thank you, Mr. Zaidi. Uh, next, we'll hear from David Paletta. Mr. Paletta, welcome. You also have three minutes. Start. Good evening. My name is David Paletta. I would first like to address members of the McDougal Terrace community. And I want you to know there are people in the community that care about you and we want to help. Your pain is real. Your grievances are legitimate. And your cause is just. Don't give up. I also want to say these people are not the problem. Members of council, I attended last Wednesday's DHA meeting and I wanted to report what I observed. There were a lot of very angry people at the meeting. This is a humanitarian crisis. This is Durham's Katrina. You did not cause this crisis. It's been in the works for many years, but you are the city leaders that must solve it. Second, DHA approved six million for repairs. This is not a reliable number. No one knows how many millions it's gonna cost. However, uh, the DHA staff is working hard. They're doing their best, but they're focused on specific issues like gas and mold. No one is looking at the big picture. Are there other serious issues that are not being addressed. As bad as this situation is, it can get much worse. For this reason, I recommend the city hire an outside expert who would do a complete safety study of this complex and to assure you and to assure the residents that all the known dangers are present. Third, I witnessed a complete breakdown in communication and trust between DHA and the residents. I'm not blaming anyone. However, the city must address this loss of trust. It is complex. Fixing the buildings alone are not gonna solve the crisis. The trust issue must be corrected and restored. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paletta. I will now hear from Mary Molina. Ms. Molina, welcome. You also have three minutes. Thank you. Evacuated residents from McDougal Terrace continue to suffer with their entire families relegated to a single room without a kitchen and without a play area for children who are essentially on lockdown. It's outrageous when you understand that all of Durham's public housing has the same or similar issues. Issues requiring the same kinds of maintenance, repairs, and upgrades to even come close to passing the ne next inspection. There needs to be an investigation to determine the actions taken by the DHA board, the CEO, and the city council liaison during and since the last two HUD inspections. Inspections that in resulted in extremely low and failing grades. We need to know exactly what a what has occurred to date to correct the problems that have been identified and to know precisely how the 24 life-threatening violations have been corrected or whether they have been corrected and how much longer repairs and maintenance are really expected to take place before residents can get back to normal lives. There needs to be an auditable system in place for all maintenance requests and records of service for each apartment and it should be available and accessible to each tenant. The DHA liaison should be replaced, replaced by someone who advocates and supports the residents and has their confidence in return and who will follow through with and report back to help ensure that the issues identified have been addressed. <clears throat> Durham's public housing has been essentially unlivable by any reasonable standards for years. Should they not be held to the same standard as other landlords in this city? DHA has waived rent for the residents for January and February. How about tenants get refunds for all the rent they've paid since the last time their housing passed inspection? 
that would at least be some amount of fairness in a situation that is totally out of their control. Thank you, Ms. Molina. We'll now hear from Mr. Green. Mr. Green. Welcome, Mr. Green. You have three minutes. All right. How y'all doing? Okay. My name is Green, Conhead Green. First, I want you to see something. This is what Matt Duke Terrace wanted to do. We want to live, but there's been a problem. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm a biblical man. The Bible said, it said, acknowledge God in all thy ways, and I shall direct thy path. But when there's, there's a problem like this, evil is present. And sometimes we do things intentionally, <coughs> but sometimes not intentionally, but we have a lot of hard evil in our hearts because we don't know what we're doing is right or wrong. We need understanding. And see, I've been over there at Maduka Terrace for seven years. When I moved back to Durham, I came to Durham to look out for my sister and my mom. My sister done passed, but two of them. I got one more sister that's living. Now y'all got me out here at a hotel where I can't get to Durham when I want to to check on my last sister. And then I'm gonna say just a little, just a little bit, see them. Maduka Terrace, to me, Need to be turned down. Because, see, the wall, I used to do construction. And whenever you put up uh, sheetrock, you could, you could fix sheetrock. You could cut it and fix it and put it in another piece. But whenever you're dealing with, um, with, with, with molding, it, don't, it do, don't have the same texture. And once you start digging into those walls, you can't see the cracks, but the cracks be on the opposite side, and they be coming up the wall. Eventually, they're going to start coming down once you start digging into the old walls, because they're old. They're just like an a, a old person. If you hit an old person right, you're going to fracture something. That's just like the walls, of the, the walls in that new material. They are old, and they need to be new. They need to be revived. They need to be new. And, and so that's all, that's all I got to say. We're going to turn this evil right here to liberal, to something right. We want to live. We don't want to die, and we don't want to see none of, none of our, uh, our friends and families die either. We want to live. Matt Dude Terrence wants want to live. That's why we are here tonight, and that's why we're coming back again, because we want to live, not die because of somebody's idiocy of evil of not knowing what they need to do. If you want to know what to really do, ask somebody. Amen. Ask somebody that lived there. Ask them, not just go up to them and, and, and say, oh, how you doing? No. Ask somebody. Ask me. Ask the audience. Ask people that live there. Kawhi. Thank you, I'm Mr. Green. Live. Thank you, Mr. Green. <laughs> the next we'll hear from Jacqueline Wagstaff. Ms. Wax Ms. Wagstaff, welcome. You have three minutes. Always a pleasure, Ms. Mag Ms. Always a pleasure, Ms. Wagstaff. Um, always a pleasure to be before you, but uh, I'm not here for you. I'm for your liaison. Um, like they said, everything they said is true. And Mr. Mayor, you were over there last Sunday, so you went through some trauma too. I know you did, so you probably need some mental health counseling right about now after what you saw. Um, but the liaison for me is, it's incredible to not see her then, and then when we finally see her at a meeting, she doesn't open her mouth. She has no questions. We get a presentation, we sit there and look at a presentation that talks about what they're gonna do. They're gonna stick a pipe in the middle of these people's living room, run it up the wall, run it out the ceiling. They're gonna throw a water heater in where you gotta put another tank on it to, to keep the water heater from exploding. I mean, some of the stuff I saw at this board meeting, 
Your board members should have been asking questions. They just sat there. No questions, no nothing. And like Mary said, we need a new liaison. We need someone that has a compassion for people, that understands that those are lives in McDougal Terrace, not just a campaign pledge when we're running. We trot through there for six months, and we play on a few residents, and we shower them with all of the acknowledgement, and then when it's over, we don't see them no more. They don't need that. McDougal Terrace should not be your campaign ground. This is horrible. I go every day. I see these residents every day. They can tell you I see them every day. And when I don't see them, they'll call. We're, we're fighting fires for DHA. We're standing, we're standing in the gap because they don't trust. The trust was lost 20 years ago because of the interaction of that that organization with the residents. I've sat in those, I've come to, down to the housing authority and I've listened to some of the staff, how they speak with the residents. Residents can come in and ask about their rent and they get treated like they're less than. They're being told, we'll get back to you. And some of the things they say to them makes no sense. Now I'll give Anthony Scott credit. He did put the manager at the Millennial after we talked about it for a while. We have a manager in the millennial now, and that cut back on some of the teenagers who don't get up and go to school. They kind of hang out at the hotel. It's a lot going on. And it would be nice if somebody other than the mayor would trot around and look at what's going on with those residents because we haven't seen any of y'all. Now, the mayor's come through, but it's gonna take more than you coming through shaking hands and, and you know being in their presence because they're starstruck when you come. It's the mayor. You know, that's just starstruck, but what are you gonna do? Like I said, you had some years on this council. You were the liaison. This is not a problem that happened overnight. I've been trotting through there for 20 years, and these problems been going on for more than 20 years. So we've known about it, but you gotta do something more than what we're seeing. These residents deserve better. Thank you, Ms. Wagstaff. <laughs> Ms. Laura Betty. Welcome, Ms. Betty, you also have three minutes. Thank you, good evening. Um, we at the Millennium Hotel just received the unsettling news that we will be no longer there after the 14th of February. Now, this is an is unconscionable uh, um, to people, to children who are already suffering to a large extent from PTSD. Um, a number of residents have expre expressed grave concerns about going back to McDougal's. Um, I was just wondering, isn't there any possibility that the residents, at least a millennium, some of the re millennium residents could move into uh, re other refurbished uh, um, communities like Detmar Court or um, a Maureen Road, and if that's not possible, is there a possibility we can some, somehow place the residents um, in close by cities where they may have uh, relatives and friends, uh, cities they're familiar with, because this is really a crisis and it's a mental health crisis that's just <coughs> growing, and it's just not fair to these kids. I mean, they just suffer tremendously, and, and they're not able to fulfill their potential because their education is interrupted. So I beg you to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Betty. All right. Uh, those are our speakers, and I'll now ask if there are any comments by members of the council. Members of the council? Anyone want to make any comments? If not, I'll make mine, but first I'd like to hear if anyone else has any. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I can just give folks a quick update of the presentation that we heard um, last week at the Housing Authority meeting. 
and kind of where they are in the process. I know a number of the residents who are here um, speaking were at that meeting, so it's not information for them, but for anyone who wasn't there and who would like a little bit more details. Um, what we know now from DHA, they've completed all of the inspections of the apartments. That's just the inspections that um, that were done, ordered, done to check for um, the carbon monoxide, any gas leaks or issues with the appliances, any mold problems and any other problems um, that they might need to fix. They have estimated that the um, repairs will cost at least $6 million. Um, as we've, as they've told us before, the total amount of funding that they have in their fund each year for maintenance is $7 million. And so they'll be applying for an emergency grant from the federal government from HUD to cover that $6 million. And that's, you know, it, that number could go up, but it's at least $6 million. Um, the repairs have already started and they'll continue um, over the next few weeks. The uh, application for emergency assistance will be submitted in the very near future, and so we'll hear about that um, hopefully pretty soon. Of course, we know that the funding uh, resources that HUD has for these sorts of emergency situations are also limited. So I want to continue to reiterate that the city has never turned down a request for funding from DHA and that we are fully prepared to assist um, with any funding needs that come up to ensure that these homes can be returned to a habitable condition and that folks can return home if they want to. Um, I understand that there are people who may not want to return to McDougal Terrace and um, the housing authority I know is uh, dealing with folks who might request transfers um, to other communities and I'm hopeful that if folks don't wanna return home that there'll be other options for them. Um, we are also hearing a lot of folks um, comment that given the condition of the buildings that McDougal Terrace needs to be torn down. Um, the issue with that though, is that we don't have 350 homes to replace McDougal Terrace with right now. Um, the long-term plan for all of Durham Housing Authority properties is for them to be redeveloped, for all of the properties to be completely redeveloped over the next couple of decades with Durham Housing Authority funding, city funding, um, and tax credits and other sources of funding loans um, that will allow this to happen. But it's not gonna happen quickly. It's a slow process, building housing takes a long time. And so we, the Housing Authority has already started the process of redoing their communities. They renovated Daymar Court and Mooring Road, as folks mentioned before. They've reno renovated Laurel Oaks apartments. Um, they're starting to um, work on, their, their next piece is they're working on JJ Henderson Tower and we'll be building a new senior housing building on the site of JJ Henderson Towers. And then there are several other communities that are next in line. So long-term, we do want to redevelop McDougal Terrace entirely, um, but we also need to ensure that for the immediate future, that the homes are livable, that people can return home to safe community and can live there um, for the time that it takes to actually redevelop the entire community. Um, so again, you know, things are, things are moving. I know that that's not comforting to folks who are still in hotels um, after over a month and are anticipating being in hotels for another month. Um, this is not the situation that any of us would wanna be in and it's not the situation that we are, you know, it's not a situation that we wish on anyone. The DHA is going to continue to, to repair these homes as quickly as they can. Um, and we're hoping that people will be home as soon as possible. But the, the work has to continue and the work will be done as soon as they can get it done. And if they need any assistance from the city, we stand prepared to provide that assistance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Is there anyone else that has any comments? Anyone else? <coughs> Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank all of you as always for being here tonight. Um, I just wanna to say to you very directly, if in the old days you would have been home already, the reason why you would have been home already is because um, you ever send your kid to clean their room and it only took them six minutes and you went to the room and it was all clean but then you opened the closet and everything was stuffed in the closet or underneath the bed. Um, in the old days, you would have been home already. But um, when Mr. Scott came here the first night, you came to your chamber. Um, I asked him to promise us 
that he would not let anybody back into those homes knowing that they were not habitable. And he promised that, and we got that assurance. Here's the deal, and I said this at a work session to you before, the, the, the length of time you're out of your home is directly proportional to how deep the problem is. You were right. You were right. And this time, we're not gonna allow people to push the clothes in the closet or put them under the bed. And Mayor Pro Tem said something instructive. Because we can't tear it down right now, the real price tag of making it habitable, short of tearing it down, is more than we've been spending to just patch it up. It takes time. And, and our kids should be safe. Our kids should be able to run around and stretch. And if we've got to do some things uh, with Durham Parks and Recreation and other partners in this city to make the situation as livable as it can be, and I know it's not, but as livable as it can be, but hear me well, you were right about how bad it was. And the length of time is directly reflective of how bad it was. And the amount of work and time it's gonna to take to make it livable, what we used to do is not acceptable anymore. But you're bearing, that, now you're bearing the brunt of that, so that may not be any, any comfort to you, but you were right. And that's what's happening. That when we're poking a hole in the wall and we're seeing how bad it is, you can't just throw paint over it, not on this watch. Can't do it. Uh, and it takes time to make it livable. That's what's happening. And in the meantime, if we need to do more to let the kids stretch their, their legs, and, and, and then, then we should be doing it. And, and we need to do it. But, um, but the reality is you were right about how bad it is. That's why it's taking so long. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Any other comments? Well, members of the council, I have a few comments I'd like to make as well. I want to thank everybody for being here tonight and for uh, your public comment. It's all very important, and uh, we're all listening hard, and we're taking in what you say. Um, I have been spending time this past couple of weeks in as many of the hotels as I can get to to try to hear from people, talk to them about their individual situations, listen about their individual situations. Uh, and what I have seen is something that uh, doesn't surprise me, but is always important to see face-to-face -face and fresh, which is uh, the individual, difficult individual situations in which people are living. Not only the difficult situations in which they're living in the hotels, but just hearing about the difficulties of the lives of so many people in McDougal Terrace who have so many ways, before they were ever in these hotels a month ago, so many ways in which they have struggled. I've heard people talking about the jobs they get and the wages that they're paid at those jobs. I've heard people talking about the transportation challenges that they face. And I have seen very close up, as several of you all have mentioned, uh, the mental health problems and challenges that so many people face. And when people go back home in McDougal Terrace, people will still be facing many of these same problems. And we have to make sure that what we do doesn't just stop when people go back home, but we're able to serve people in McDougal Terrace in very significant ways that we have not in the past. When I was speaking on Martin Luther King Day on several occasions, I said uh, what I wanna repeat tonight. I apologize, I apologize on behalf of myself I apologize on behalf of previous councils and elected officials. We have not done what is necessary to make the lives of the people in McDougal Terrace what they need to be. And I recognize that this is a problem that has been 40 years in the making, but we're the ones, we're the ones that need to make it right. That is our responsibility. I know it is my responsibility. I also know that our community has looked the other way for far too long, far too long. If you've never been in McDougal Terrace before, you've driven by it. 
we all bear a very significant responsibility to make this right. I appreciated uh, what the Mayor Pro Tem described about the Housing Authority's plans and the detail around that. I, I, I want to say that we don't know when people are going to get back home simply because the, the Housing Authority doesn't want to predict when people are going to be back home and not really know. So as soon as the Housing Authority knows when people will be, back, be able to be back home, you will know. You will know. It won't happen all at once. When buildings are ready, people will be able to move back. But as Councilmember Middleton said and the Mayor Pro Tem, no one will be moving back until their, their apartments are safe. We don't want to move people back into situations that aren't safe. And a lot of work is being done to make that true. The communication and trust issues that have been raised tonight and so many times and so many times as I've heard from people as I have been speaking to them these last couple of weeks are very, very true and real. And they are very powerful issues that are at the root of a lot of our problems. And we have to challenge that. We have to change that as well. I have a lot of faith in um, Mr. Scott. I've said before, and I will say again, he's an excellent director of the Durham Housing Authority, and he has my full confidence. He has been transparent. He's operated with a lot of dignity and a lot of transparency and the tremendous hard work that I've seen the Durham Housing Authority staff do to try to make this right has been admirable. I also want to say that I, uh, I think Jillian has been a very good liaison. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson has been a very good liaison with Durham Housing Authority and will continue to be. And finally, I just want to repeat. We all need to be doing everything we can to get these folks home as soon as we can, as soon as their apartments are safe. Every day there are discussions and that, that go on. I, I talk to Mr. Scott almost every day about the progress, the number of apartments that are being repaired, what is the status of those repairs. I know the city manager is on a daily call as well with housing authority, county officials, people from Alliance Mental Health. There's a lot of good work and coordination going on, but we all recognize that those folks, and, and, and from the many discussions I've had over the last couple of weeks, I personally know the way in which people in these hotels have been suffering in ways that they should not. If you're in a hotel for a month with three kids, it's hard. It's really hard. Even if you have a cash card for food, and even if you might be one of the people that has transportation, it's hard. And I have seen many difficult situations and many traumatic situations. And we need to get people as, as home as soon as we can. And after they're home, we have to keep at it. We have to keep at it. So I appreciate all of you all. And I will say again that I consider this my responsibility to get this job done right. All of our responsibilities. But I will tell you that I consider it mine. And I will work until we have made it right. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I'm now going to move on to item four on our agenda, and I believe Mr. Mr. Fenner has some comments about that. Mr. Fenner? <laughs> Mr. Fenner, uh, you're addressing the item Grant contract with Legal Aid of North Carolina to provide legal representation to the city of Durham residents facing eviction. You have three minutes, sir. Yeah. I'm confused as to why we are spending money for legal aid that the state should be funding. If a person cannot pay their rent, why would you spend taxpayer dollars for have legal aid to go and drag them into court when they got a mortgage to pay? If you can't pay the rent, you can't pay the rent. You should not have legal aid to go in there and prolong or cause that landlord discomfort or, or violate their constitutional rights to able to have that home to rent out. You're wasting $500,000 that legal aid job should be funded through the state, not through, this, not through the city. You just said you spent $500,000 
a week at the hotel, and you can't spend hundred thousand dollars to put new furnaces and and stoves in McDougal. So somewhere along the line, you all not being accountable of our taxpayer dollars. You asked for a bond, affordable housing bond, $95 million. Who's going to live in them? You ain't paying no salaries. You don't even pay your city employees $36,000 a year. So who are you billing them for? You sit up here and say you're responsible that Mr. Scott is an upstanding young man, a whole nine yards. He been at Durham Housing Authority for almost, what, five years, 10 years? He's upstanding, and that's what you're backing. You're questionable. Your character is questionable. For you all to sit up here, you backing a man who has allowed this mess to continue after they have collected millions of taxpayers' dollars, and you sit up here with your arms folded, mouths perched up, ready to jump on me because I'm telling you what I think. You're sad. You're even sadder because you're giving these folks a bunch of bull. Because you've been on that board for almost three years as a liaison. And now you want somebody, it is your responsibility. It's always been your responsibility. My question is, where is our money gone? Who has our money? Where is it not an audit done? You sat on the board for Go Triangle who spent $160 million of taxpayers' money. And no one has nowhere where it went to by a tunnel. Well, where's the tunnel at? You were there. I saw you there. It is time for you all to be accountable for our taxpayer dollars. Property tax goes up means people's rent goes up. Thank you, Mr. Fenner. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you do. Mr. Fenner, uh, just for the, your information, uh, Mr. Scott's been director of the Housing Authority for about three years. Um, um, uh, and the money that we're allocating for the eviction diversion I wish it was supplied by the state or the federal government, but since it's not, our local government is gonna step in and provide that funding, and we believe that's an important job that we can do. We can help prevent the eviction of many, many people, and that's our plan. All right, council members, I'll uh, accept a motion on item four. Move approval. Second. second. Move and second that we approve the eviction diversion funding in item four. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. We'll now move to item five, shared active transportation report and an ordinance revision. And this has been pulled by a resident, Mimi Kessler. Ms. Kessler. Welcome, Ms. Kessler, and you have three minutes. Thank you. My name's Mimi Kessler. I live at 1418 Woodland Drive. Um, this uh, item is of concern to a wide variety of people who live and who drive cars in Durham. And what I found from looking at the uh, survey that was out, that, that went out, that on average, there were 1486 um, 1,486 people who responded to the questions, which when divided into the um, population of Durham of 600, excuse me, 267,743 is less than 1%. So 53% um, of the people who responded are between the ages of 25 and 44. 65% of them are white. 25% are uh, earn 50,000 to 100,000. 18% earn 100 to 150,000, which together is 43%. 86% of them say they never wear helmets. 1,564 uh, 1, respondents said that they uh, supported 
scooters and and the, the, those people, there were 40%, 42%, whereas the people who disliked and felt that it was a dangerous liability was 41%. They don't support the continued program. In the cross-tabulated area, those who support 81% have ridden one of these scooters and only 55% have not ridden them. So I feel like that the focus of the survey was primarily on scooter users. And I don't think that the city has taken into account how automobile drivers feel. There was some documentation about the scooters being left on, the, um, on sidewalks, on uh, private property, um, and those are problems. Um, but the concerns that I hear from my neighbors and my friends are, they're afraid of what their liability will be if somebody on a scooter who has no protective equipment just runs out in front of their car. What is the liability to the automobile driver? And we don't feel like that this has been assessed. We don't feel like we've actually had an opportunity to weigh in on this. This is one of those uh, surveys that, you know, yes, you took a survey, but less than 1% of the population of Durham responded to it because there was no, there was no advertisement. And I just think that there needs to be better analysis. Thank you. Ms. Kessler, thank you. Appreciate your comments. And um, we had a very um, comprehensive and robust discussion about many of those same issues at the work session that you've raised. You're not the only person to share those concerns. I appreciate them. Um, I'm gonna, I see that uh, Attorney Fred Lamar is here. Mr. Lamar, you may be able to answer the question about the driver liability. I would assume it would be the same liability that you would face if someone was riding a bicycle and you hit them, but you, I may be wrong. Could you comment on that? Fred Lamar with the city attorney's office. No, I was actually gonna uh, mention skateboard rider or or bicycle rider, um, uh, it would be the similar kind of liability situation with that. Um, <clears throat> right now, the state has elected not to, to regulate uh, scooters, so hopefully over time, the legislature may step in and may decide there, there, there may be some financial responsibility on the part of scooter riders. They don't do it for bicycle riders. But uh, that's, that, that, that would be my response, just what you said, Mr. Mayor. So if I hit a bicycle rider in my car, I guess the liability is mine if I'm at fault. That's correct. If I'm not at fault, I have no liability. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Um, I want to just uh, affirm that uh, we, we have had, Ms. Kessler, a discussion in the council where, again, we share many of the concerns that you have. We recognize that there are safety issues with scooters that are being worked out nationally. Uh, and um, so we'll be watching this very carefully. This is not something that uh, we'll stop paying attention to. Uh, we have, I think, very uh, reasonable regulations given our, uh, what, what we know now. Uh, and so I'm certainly in favor of this, but I agree that this is something that needs to be watched carefully over time, and we will be. So I appreciate you bringing those issues to us. All righty, can I have a motion now that we approve item five, which is uh, shared active transportation report and ordinance? Moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the shared active transportation report and ordinance revision. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you. There being no other business to come before this body, I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned at 8 14.